one corner, he'll be here. Uh, but if I can shout at him, you know, I once said this to Sandy Berger after he had stepped down as National Security Advisor. I said, China is managing you more than you are managing China. He glared at me and paused. But he was obviously troubled. That night at dinner, he mentioned to a mutual friend what I said. Um, so it was buzzing in his head. I think I'm absolutely right. The US understands China much more than China understands the US. And therefore, it is incumbent upon China to restrain itself and ensure that over the next one, two years, with a new Trump administration, that it, it should not get overly excited over con congressional testimonies or over remarks or over even sporadic action, but to, be, but to maintain strategic discipline until relations get back on course. And for strategic discipline, the Chinese are very good because it is a disciplined system, it is highly centralized, they have influence over the media. If you remember when uh, the US planted almost a chicken, chicken pox, you know, bugs on Jiang Zemin's Air Force One. <laughs> it was all reported, it was all over the media. China breathed not a word. They just ripped out the aeroplane, refitted it. And when the Chinese embassy in Belgrade was hit by missiles sitting from two or three different directions, they knew people were angry, so they let them throw stones. Subsequently, they, com they, com subsequently they compensated the US for damage done to the embassy. After one week, they turned it down. They will bite their tongue till it bleeds to maintain strategic discipline. So I, I, I worry like you, but I think they'll do all they can to manage the situation. And I'm quite sure in Davos, Xi Jinping will play the role of a very responsible global citizen. He will not seek leadership. He will not say a word about one thing displace the US, you will, you will not be critical of anybody, you will just dispense favours and, and kind words. <laughs> I, I, th I think this will be his stance when he goes to Davos, and it will work very well. Thank you. If nothing else, in contrast. Yes, please. I'm a little surprised that during your speech in the last hour, you said to talk about Taiwan, which is a very important topic of the whole Sino-US relationship. How do you see it in the next four years? Ago? Taiwan has a, has a very weak hand. Uh, Xi Jinping took some risks in opening a road for her when he met Ma Ying Chiu in Singapore as an equal. It was a departure from long-established Chinese position. And I'm sure internally he will have criticized. He did it not for Ma Ying Chiu. He did it so that Tsai Ing-wen knows that there is a road forward for her. Not the road she prefers, but it is a serviceable road. She is beholden to a DPP establishment which, from the time of 2 to 8, felt a deep grievance against the mainland. It was actually against the KMT, but it transferred onto the CCP. And there's no doubt the DPP has closer ties to the ground than the KMT. But the leadership at the top, they are very dark green. She herself, I mean, they said that she was the one who drafted the Liang Guo for Li Tenghui. That's probably her deep self, but she's pragmatic. 
So what's China doing? China is tightening all the screws gradually. At every point giving her a way out. At every point giving her a way out. Will the US die for Taiwan? No, of course not. But if China were to become unreasonably aggressive, then it must provoke the US to retaliate. But so long as China doesn't do that, but just move in a gradual, graduated way, she will find that the livelihood of ordinary Taiwanese will be affected. And politics is, in the end, about livelihood. We will take time, but I think her uh, uh, options are narrowing. Thank you very much. Take a look on the diplomacy. First, it was uh, Gambia who switched sides. Uh, Latin America, they're living in open first. And now Nigeria said, you've got a trade office, a, a, a trade office. What is he doing in Abuja? It should be in Lagos. Abuja is for political officers, so please shut it down, move. Uh, Wang Yi was there, I said, it's a very wise decision. <laughs> One last question over there. I'd like to ask about uh, Japan. Uh, what uh, risks and opportunities do you see for the Sino-Japanese relationship, primarily military and strategic, over the next four, five, six years? Because of the war, I think Japan, the persona of Japan has been distorted. They have to bow before the U.S. They face the prospect of a China which will again become dominant in East Asia. They know that in their bones. And they would much prefer to be a normal country. Obama went to Hiroshima. He did not apologize because the Americans felt then that there were more justification. By today's standards, there's no justification, but by the standards <coughs> of that time. So Abe went to Pearl Harbor, and he also did not apologize. Because the Japanese have always believed that they were forced into that war when the US said, if you don't pull up from China, there'll be an embargo. So it's really Japan and China. And China said, what have we done to you? And what have you done to us? But during that period, when the Western powers were carving out Asia for themselves, the Japanese knew that if they did not move, it was only a matter of time before Japan itself became a colony. And their greatest fear was Russia, because that is Russia already had moved into Manchuria all the way to the Laotong Panta, the Laotong Peninsula. So they moved, they fought Russia. I mean, first Qing Dynasty, then Russia. And today, if you go to uh, outside Dalian, you find cemeteries, Russian soldiers, Japanese soldiers. It was partly Liban's realm, they needed living space, they saw the imperial powers covering up China, so they had to cover up China. Now they are trapped in a position which, what they're economically significant, and they always be because of their remarkable culture, they feel that they're not, they're not whole. I think you need another generation before Japan has a more mature relationship with the U.S. and reconciles itself to a China which it knows will be dominant again, but to which, unlike other countries around China, never paid tribute. Okinawa always paid tribute, but except for the third Tokugawa shogun, who paid tribute, the rest never did. And Chinese and uh, Japanese scholars have always criticized that shogun for, for paying tribute to China. So there is, in Japan, because they're distant from China, a sense of 
or a sense of market, but also a sense of separateness. Today, Japan is a very popular destination for Chinese tourists. They go there, they love everything, from the food to the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> and many of them wish that they could be like that. And when they go to Taiwan, they see a little of Japan in Taiwan, which is Chinese. And I tell my Taiwanese friends, that is Taiwan's soft influence on China. Imagine if all of China were like Taiwan. What a marvelous place it would be. So this complex interaction between China and its periphery, which includes Japan, which is, I think, you know, Fairbanks and Reichshauer classified Japan together with Korea and Vietnam as part of the Chinese sphere. Uh, Huntington, I think, exaggerated it in the other, excuse me, by describing Japan as a separate civilization. I would say Japan is a sister civilization, and these sisters have got to live together. Thank you very much, Mr. George. George, I think on behalf of everybody in the room, I must thank you for your most inspiring insight. And it proves that uh, graduates from Harvard Business School <laughs> knows a lot more than doing LBO models and making money. <laughs>